Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly interview show where top chess players, authors, content creators, and accomplished amateurs discuss their careers and share stories and chess improvement tips. Perpetual Chess is a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network, and we'd like to give special thanks to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. For more information about the show, you can go to perpetualchesspod.com. But without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess, Chess Books Recaptured. Of course, this is a monthly book discussion podcast. We did take last month off, so thanks to everyone uh, for indulging me. Just needed to recharge my batteries. I read a lot of chess books for this podcast, but uh, now I'm raring to go. We've got one for this month, and already next month, it, m- next month's pod is being planned as well. Uh, but this month, what we're going to discuss is a classic book. It's called Fire on Board by Grandmaster Alexei Shirov. Uh, our guest co-host is Mitch Fabian. He is an actuary, a dad, a chess dojo super user, an accomplished improver. Uh, he's gained tons of points uh, in his early to mid-20s. His peak Lee Chess classical rating is 2431. And he describes himself as a person who has spent too much time studying openings. Um, longtime internet friends with Mitch, but this is my first time talking to him. So without further ado, let's welcome Mitch. Mitch, how are you? Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, it's uh, it's an honor to be here uh, uh, amongst uh, great company. Uh, I've been on this podcast. I've been listening for many years now. Uh, you were my uh, co-pilot for the times that I had a two-hour commute in, uh, when I was still in Texas and uh, definitely listened to this pod religiously. And uh, it's such an honor to be on here. So thank you so much for having me. Thanks, man. You're too kind. Well, I'm happy to have you as well. Obviously, we've corresponded a fair amount online, and I'm I'm an admirer of just how quickly you've made uh, chess progress, which maybe we can do a little bonus session on towards the end of the interview, although, of, I mean, the conversation. But, of course, we're also going to interview you properly on an Adult Improver Edition someday, so we'll have to save some for that, too. But anyway, topic of this podcast, of course, is Fire on Board, uh, again, classic book by Alexei Shirov. We'll be telling you all about it. But Mitch, uh, this was your suggestion. So let's hear it. Why did you feel like this would be a fun book to discuss? Yeah, so I, I've heard Fire on Board recommended uh, many times by by different uh, coaches uh, on, on Twitter. And um, especially our friend uh, Kostya Kavitsky uh, has mentioned it several times, both on Twitter and in other podcast interviews that he's done. Uh, and uh, one thing that really struck me when he was talking about it was that uh, he said, when you are kind of stuck and not knowing where you should focus next in your chess, it's a really good idea to pick up a, a games collection annotated by the actual player themselves uh, to, to see their ideas and uh, use those ideas in your own games. Uh, so I, I picked it up uh, uh, about a year ago, I think, a little less than a year ago for the first time, read, read a probably the first two chapters plus a little bit of the third chapter, which we'll get to is uh, pretty much the third chapter is the book. Um, And I really liked that he kept all of his slots from his original annotations and then added additional comments to them rather than just rewriting all of his annotations for the games. Um, Because you see several times where his annotations actually have mistakes in them and he corrects them. And I think that's a lot better to learn from uh, than just seeing the computer variations, which of, of course this is an older book, so there are no computer variations. I, I think he mentions in the introduction that he checked it with Ribka. It was Fritz Four, I believe. Fritz Four, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like very <laughs> low power engines. So um, unfortunately, if you're very into engine checking, uh, this book is not quite for you. So uh, Neil Bruce uh, might not like the book as much when he does his uh, annotated games. Uh, bracket. Um, but I, I think that uh, it's very excusable and actually I think makes for a better book in, in my opinion. Yeah. And it's funny because when he mentions Fritz Four, he kind of apologizes for it because he's basically <laughs> like, it's worthless, but I checked it anyway. Whereas yeah. now it's like the engines are like the all-knowing gods and uh, mm-hmm. you, you can never override them. But but I do think, and on the topic of engines, um, you know, we should mention that it's coming on Chessable um, you can, there's a games file on chessgames.com. So, uh, I think both you and I read it on Kindle, um, mm-hmm. where obviously you can't just pop on an engine on Kindle, but what I did was, um, 
copied, I got the games file from chess games just because it's easier for me to find it than in my chess base and then loaded it into a Lee chess study and then would have the engine on sporadically. So that's one way you can use a more modern engine. Um, but again, I think it's coming to Chessable soon. So uh, listeners may want to wait for the uh, the Chessable treatment. Um, I think it's even, according to Chessable's webpage, Simon Williams might even do the video version. So something worth waiting for if after this podcast, you decide this is a book worth purchasing. Um, it's also in paper form. I should mention, I read this book when it came out. It was a kind of a landmark book. I feel like it's one of those books that, I mean, especially if you were, um, say, over 1800 or ambitious, um, I think it was a book that a lot of people picked up. Um, and I was certainly one of them. So I read it then. I read it again now and and will be sharing sharing my thoughts about it. Um, now, Mitch, do you agree that it's probably best suited for, say, 1800 up? Uh, that's 1800 feet A slash USCF. Yeah. So I would say if you want the very most out of it, you're probably like high 1900s uh, looking to break 2000. Uh, however, I do think that anyone can benefit from uh, from either this book or a similar games collection um, annotated by uh, the actual player, uh, because there are very interesting instances where uh, like Shirov puts like an exclam on a move uh, that I would never have looked at. And uh, it's funny because I engine check some of those exclams and the engine says it's like a mistake or something. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it's a very aggressive move, uh, which, um, you know, wasn't particularly thought of by uh, by myself uh, when I was reading it. And uh, it makes me think more on the type of moves that I, I, would, I should be thinking of. Uh, so it's really great to see that. And uh, he has a lot of thoughts in there. Uh, for instance, there's there's a game in which uh, the, the rook on FA is being attacked by a bishop and anyone would just move the rook to E8 on that on that move. But he's he's mentions that he sat there thinking for a long time about uh, a rook sacrifice by just moving the knight with what appeared to be a very quiet move um, and something where, you know, I would instantly less than a second move the rook over. Um, so because of that, uh, I think that a book like this uh, is still valuable for anyone, although I will caveat that um, I found several of the games very difficult to follow uh, because of how like insane some of the calculation was. Um, yeah. So I, I will caveat that uh, I think it is definitely, if you want the most out of it, you are a higher rated player. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I had the same issue, Mitch. I mean, this this guy, obviously world-class player. Um, we'll, we'll get more into his bio in a minute. But yeah, I mean, it's it's daunting at times. So I encourage listeners to hear our conversation. Hopefully you'll get to hear, hear a few chess improvement takeaways. And then from there, uh, decide uh, whether it's the best use of your chess improvement Dollars, And I did want to mention, you know, with these book recap podcasts, I try not to do too many strictly advanced books or too many strictly beginner books. Um, but this one I would definitely put in the advanced category. Although, again, it's um, it's historical enough that I think it could be of interest to anyone. But I will say next next month I'll be doing Play Winning Chess by Yasser, which is a firmly classic book, but firmly beginner oriented. So um, so listeners who decide this one isn't for you have that to look forward to um, in June. Um, so a little bit more about Shirov's background. I mean, Mitch, let's let's start with you. Um, you know, obviously to me, it's like I associate Shirov with this book. Uh, we'll get into his own personal story momentarily, but this book is almost synonymous with Shirov. Is that the case for you as well, Mitch? Yeah. So. I have to be honest, other than reading this book, I did not know much about Shirov. Uh, I had heard of Shirov in the in the conversation with uh, creative players like Tall. Yeah. Um, however, I honestly didn't know how old Shirov was. I didn't know exactly when he played. Like I knew from the recent, I, I think it was the Grand Swiss that he played in. Uh, I had seen interviews of him and seen him play and was astounded by some of his play. Uh, and I honestly thought he was a bit older than he is. Uh, he's turning 50 um, this July 4th, uh, which uh, I find interesting that his birthday is uh, on July 4th and he plays with such fireworks. Uh, yeah, so, that's a good one. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, I learned a lot about his history here. Um, I, I've uh, heard before that he's considered one of the strongest players to never become world champion. 
Um, and but other than that, like I didn't know much about him. Uh, so it was great to read this book and see all of his games against legends like Kramnik and Ivanchuk and whatnot. Uh, every game, or not every game, like at least 80% of the games, I recognized the name of his opponent. Um, and so I, I find it interesting that I hadn't seen too many Shiav games beforehand. Um, so yeah, to, to me, th this book taught me taught me Shirov, so I, I would agree it's synonymous with him. <laughs> yeah, and as you say, his name is synonymous with attacking. Although one of my conclusions from this book, again, to uh, spoil a conclusion early, is like, yes, he's an attacking player, but more than that, I think what we can take from him is he's a creative player. Mm -hmm. um, top five player in the world. He peaked at number two in 1994, although there's a lot of... Uh, um, political intrigue in the um, the government, air quote, organizations of chess in the 1990s, as um, more experienced listeners will know. So when he was number two, Kasparov wasn't included because he was in a separate faction that he and Nigel Short had created called the PCA. So he was technically the third highest rated in the world. But anyway, it's not important. Obviously, the guy's a chess monster. But just wanted to be be clear about that. Um, so he learned under the tutelage of uh, Vladimir Bagarov, who was Tal's trainer. He studied with Tal himself. He studied alongside uh, Grandmaster Alex Shabalov, who, of course, has emigrated to the U.S. and is a legendary um, U.S. player. He also credits working with nine-time Latvian champ Edvins Kengis, GM Giannis Klovans and others. So there's definitely sort of like a Latvian school of chess, which comes across in his playing style, although he describes Bagarov as more solid. But obviously, Shabalov, Tal, and he are known for their their swashbuckling chess. And as, as we'll discuss in a bit, there's a chapter on a particular line of the semi-Slav that he sort of describes as like uh, having Latvian roots because so many Latvian players played the Botvinnik variation. Um, and the, again, there was a lot of political intrigue with Shirov um, playing for the world championship in the 1990s. And I did a deep dive on it that I want to share with you guys before we get into the book. Um, but first, we're going to take a break and hear from our sponsors. Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable, of course, is the premier chess educational website, which allows you to study all aspects of your game using space repetition in order to help you remember opening sequences, tactics, end games, all that stuff. They've got a bunch of fun new courses out, including Arkle's Endings. Grandmaster Keith Arkle, legendary endgame specialist who's been on the pod, nice guy as well. They just adapted his book to the Chessable format. You can learn so much from his endgame, how he grinds down masters and even his fellow grandmasters. Chessable also has a free new course available from Mr. Dodgy, reviewing I am Eric Rosen's best stalemate tricks. Of course, Eric's known for having a lot of fun endgame stalemate swindles, so you can check those out for free. So whatever aspect of your game you'd like to work on, be sure to go to chessable.com and check out all their courses available both for free and for purchase. And we are back. And we have a Patreon mailbag question from friend of the pod, Chris Wainscott, who, of course, helped me out on a prior book recap, Bobby Fisher Goes to, to War. Um, and Chris writes in to ask, it's not exactly related to the related to the book as much as it is to peak Shirov, but I want to hear some hot takes about Shirov getting passed over in favor of Kramnik after winning the right to face Kasparov. So this is like a little nugget of chess history that I think I've, I've felt this way, and I think a lot of people felt this way, that they're like, I know something happened. I don't know exactly what it was. Um, Mitch, how much did you know about the fact that Kramnik had qualified to play Kasparov in the late 90s and the match never happened? And we'll tell you more in a minute, but but Mitch, what what was your experience with, with that sad story? Yeah, so I, I knew that... So pretty much in that era there's a lot of questioning on the world champions because there's the FIDE world champion and then there's the PCA world champion with Kasparov. And I, I knew that Shirov qualified to challenge Kasparov, but that it ha didn't happen. Uh, I actually did not know that he had beaten Kramnik for that right. Um, so that was new to me when I was researching for the book. None of this is actually included in Fire on Board number one, which is what we're talking about. But Fire on Board 2 apparently has it. I have not read that yet but it's it's on my list now uh, i was I, I love this book so much that i'm definitely getting fire and board too and it's gonna probably be the next book i read 
Um, but I, I, I really did not know the situation, um, like why Kasparov didn't play Shirov or um, what exactly happened. So I, I'm uh, interested to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, I wouldn't describe them so much as my thoughts. I mean, I will share like a relatively hot take for Chris per his question when I'm done summarizing. But I will just say I, I you know, did a decent amount of Internet research and had like moderate uh, familiarity with what happened. I did live through it, but those were my college years. And I'm just going to be honest, I was too busy drinking to, uh, <laughs> you know, too busy drinking, studying and having fun. I wasn't st- following top level chess as much in uh, in those years now. But as for what happened, so the whole thing is a cluster F and it could be its own podcast. Honestly, someone should write a book about the the um, FIDE slash PCA slash World Chess Council uh, factions in the 90s and everything that happened. Someone should write the definitive story. It would be great to hear. But briefly, um, there was a vacancy in the match and uh, Anand was going to play Kramnik because they were number two and three in the world for the right to play. Kasparov, but Anand ended up declining because he was also affiliated with FIDE, which was one of the factions. Um, so instead, they selected Shirov to play, and Shirov upset Kramnik. Now, Shirov, of course, was a very strong player, but he was, I think, number seven or something in the world, and Kramnik was number two or number three. So he upset Kramnik. So now, by law, he has the right to play Kasparov. Um, and there's supposedly already a match set up with a $2 million prize fund to play Kasparov. Um, it was organized by Luis Rent- Rentero, who of course famously organized the, the Lenaris tournaments. So he was a longtime patron of chess who organized many respected tournaments, but he was raising this money, I believe with his own money in consultation with the Spanish government. But in Spain, someone lost an election and the money fell through. And then Shirov in Fire on Board 2 writes that Rentero didn't organize, didn't honor his contract. So suddenly he's not getting any money. And to make matters worse, um, in the Shirov Kramnik match, the loser gets $100,000. The winner is not doesn't get anything right away, but they're supposed to get at worst, you'll get a share of the prize fund. You know, the prize fund is $2 million and even the loser of that match gets like 35% of it. So it's supposed to be a huge payday. Um, but then that match doesn't happen. And so not only did Shirov not get the match to happen, but he didn't get any money for uh, beating Kramnik. And anyway, there were many negotiations. I mean, the Spain match fall through, fell through with Ren- Rentero organizing it, and then they had another potential organizer in Spain that fell through. There was a potential match in California, which some people say there was a million dollar prize. Some people say there was 600,000. Um, Shirov turned it down as he concedes in his book. But I mean, 600,000 prize fund instead of two million. It's a big difference. And I don't think he looked at it as like a final um you know, a final say when he turned it down, it was just a negotiation. And then there ended up being no match. And, you know, Kasparov, meanwhile, is starting to make noise about like he's having trouble finding, um, finding the funding. And he blames the fact that Shirov is the one playing him as part of the reason Shirov wrote a couple open letters sort of explaining uh, his thought process, which you can still find online, um, if you dig enough. And so it ended up that at the end of the day, by the year 2000, uh, Kasparov passed over Shirov and played Kramnik, even though Kramnik is the exact person Shirov beat, you know, mm-hmm. in order to play for the world championship. Um, so Shirov, of course, views this as illegitimate. And I don't think a lot of people are blaming Kramnik personally for this. He was more just like caught in the middle and had opportunities. And if someone offers you a lot of money to play a chess match... Mm -hmm. Um, you generally should take it. And especially since he ended up beating Kasparov. Um, So that's sort of the um, big picture of what happened. Again, Shirov writes about it in Fire on Board 2. And by the way, Fire on Board 2 um, is a bit more introspective. There are some introspective moments in Fire on Board 1, but Fire on Board 2 is right after all this stuff happened. And you can see the the tone of Shirov has changed. Um, in in Fire on Board One, he's this brash, you know. I mean, he's introspective in his game analysis, but he's not lacking for confidence. He feels like he can beat anyone. Mm-hmm. And in Fire, by the time Fire on Board Two is written, you can tell he's just weighed down a bit by all of the political nonsense he's had to put up with, 
And anyway, I mean, people, I actually recently got interviewed for Levy Rosman's podcast, should be coming out soon. And this came up and we were talking about this match. And I had just mentioned that I don't know exactly what happened, but I feel like if Kasparov wanted this match to happen, it could have happened. And having researched it a lot more, that's still where I come down. It might have been for a lot less money, you know, than the original two million. But to me, it's definitely an injustice that Kramnik was the one who played instead of Shirov. And Shirov really was never the same. I mean, obviously, he's still an amazing player. He's still active. He's been putting up great results lately. But there's a little bit of uh, an element of um, he flew to he flew too close to the sun and he he didn't get uh, his opportunity at the right time. And he opens in fire on board, too. Um, he also describes, you know, he's trying to arrange this match. And as he writes about in fire on board one, he'd gotten married, um, started a family and he returns from a tournament. And he has just found out that this the match in Spain fell through. And his wife at the time, which he sort of alludes to, uh, like he wasn't the best partner at the time. He was too focused on chess. But he his wife has emptied out their house and cleaned out their bank account. So not only has this match been canceled, but he he arrives home and his his wife is no longer there. So he writes, finally, with broken family, finances, and no sporting rights, I started a new life. So that's where it picks up. So as for hot takes, um, I would just say Shirov was robbed. Um, do, you, do you have any other hot takes, Mitch, now that I've dumped all this uh, research on you? Yeah, that, I mean, that sounds so terrible to Shirov, uh, especially losing his family as well as the right to, to this match. And um, I just, a lot of people would never be the same after that. A lot of people would be completely broken. Uh, so I, I agree, Shirov was robbed. Um, I, th- I think it's a huge shame that he didn't get the chance to play. I, I don't really think he would have beaten Kasparov, but had he beaten Kasparov, I, I think it would have been a very different chess world um, resulting from it because Kremnik's um, victory over Kasparov uh, ushered in the Berlin era and uh, uh, a lot quieter chess, whereas uh, if Shirov won, maybe we'd be seeing a lot more semi-slavs, uh, a lot more uh, aggressive chess still. Um, but it's hard to say, uh, cause, um, yeah, Shirov did not have the best results against, uh, Kaspara, whereas against other players at that time, he still had amazing results. Yeah. I mean, Shirov had never beat Kasparov in a classical game. They played like over 20 games. Um, and so that's another interesting thing is sort of trying to parse Kasparov's motivations, because if he was just wanting to keep the crown, then one would think that, he should play Shirov instead of Kramnik. Um, but I guess I don't know if he wanted a challenge or if it legitimately was the financial issue where he felt like the money couldn't be raised. But for whatever reason, Kasparov was not particularly eager to play Shirov. And yeah, it's unfortunate and we could go on about it for longer, but I think we should uh, we should get back to the book. But definitely one of those major what ifs in chess history, uh, as Mitch said. Um, yeah, and th- things might have been a lot, a lot different. Um, so let's bring it to the book. Um, so it's the book is structured in. It's got an intro by legendary British GM, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, John Spielman, and then it's got five chapters. And as we mentioned, there is some biography, but it's it's rather light. Um, what did you think of? What struck you about how the book was arranged, Mitch? Yeah, so it starts off with two very short chapters uh, from his youth, uh, growing up and winning the World Cadet. Uh, Both of these chapters are are short, but have a lot more um, biography uh, in them than the other chapters. Uh, I felt that these two chapters also, the annotations were somewhat lacking compared to the rest of the book. Uh, It seemed like he didn't take the games nearly as seriously. And of course, they weren't uh, nearly as exciting as his... uh, major career was. Uh, so I, I felt that uh, if you're reading the book and you're a little turned off by like the first two chapters, uh, the annotations get much more in depth than chapter three, uh, where chapter three essentially is the book. Uh, I, I, I'd say it's at least 80% of the book. Um, and so he switches from um, like biography, then game, then biography, then game, like he does in the first two, to a bunch of biography at the start and then just all the games. Um, so I felt that that was a weird transition there. 
Um, so I, I don't quite like that setup. I, I kind of wish that he kept with the um, biography and then a few games from the, the tournaments and then information about the tournaments and biography, et cetera. Uh, I, I felt like that was a, a nice flow from the first two chapters. Uh, and then it's very strange to me that uh, he broke out the last two chapters. Um, the Botvinnik variation uh, is a chapter which in the introduction makes it sound like it's a theoretical chapter and it is not. It is all of the games that he played in the Botvinnik variation, um, which um, one, if, if you read the chap, uh, the introduction and think you can skip the, the, the chapter, I, I don't suggest that. I think the games are great. Even if you don't play the Botvinnik, uh, uh, they're ex- extremely exciting games. And uh, I think the Botvinnik is one of the most exciting uh, openings in chess. Uh, I kind of wish that that was mixed in with the chapter three and maybe chapter three split into more chapters with time periods, just like the first two chapters. And then the fifth chapter is um, five selected end games. Uh, I, th- I think it was five. It might've been 10. Uh, it, was, it was selected end games that he went over, um, which uh, there were also great end games in the third chapter. Uh, so I felt like that also could have been kind of integrated. So I felt like the last two chapters really should have been integrated into the third chapter and maybe they split the third chapter up a bit. Uh, so that was kind of my only quibble with the book it, mainly the the Bavinik chapter i just felt like it was it, it should have been part of the actual book instead of cut to the end because i was very confused because i'm like where are all the Bavinik games when i was reading right, chapter right. three uh because i i knew like he was very famous for the Bavinik variation and i i really thought that based on the introduction that that chapter was going to just be opening lines like um like when you pick up an opening book, it's like variation one a, et cetera. Like uh, I thought that's what it was going to be, but it was just all of his uh, games in the Botvinnik. Uh, so I felt like that could have been mixed in with chapter three. Yeah. That's a really good point because I've never been a semi-Slav player. So I think back when I read the book, you know, probably around 2000, the book came out originally in 1997, by the way. Um, I skipped the, the, the Botvinnik chapter because I was like, whatever, you know, I, I, I played the Benoni at the time. So I, I wasn't interested. And as you say, the, the games are fantastic. Yeah. And they're like a part of his, they're a big part of his identity as a chess player. So they kind of belong in, in the, the general um, part of the book. And, but I, I will say that for any semi soft player that makes this book all the more indispensable. And I do like the fact that um, it's not so much like, you know, this book is 20 years old, so it's not so much about the theory as the ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, he, again, he writes about sort of the legacy of it and a, a theme that runs through the book is sort of this, uh, joint work that he does with his grandmaster colleagues on various opening variations. That's one, I mean, I'm sure that still goes on, but in the computer age, I feel like it's, it's probably not the same. Like he, he relied so much on being shown ideas or having seen something that someone else didn't see, you know, in a particular game that maybe hasn't been circulated widely yet. Mm-hmm. And again, with, with everyone having access to the same engines now, um, that's, that's less of a competitive advantage, I think. Um, I did want to read an excerpt from Spielman's Forward because I did feel like he's a great writer and he does a really good job sort of setting the stage. Um, so I'll read what, what he writes because it definitely got me fired up for Fire on Board. So Spielman writes, Every chess player has his own favorite players, games, and styles. On a professional level, I am often impressed by dry strategic games in which one very strong player manages to keep control against an equally strong opponent. But these require a perhaps excessively delicate palate. And along with the general reader, I find most enjoyable those games in which there is a maximum of violence. Those, these the reader will find in abundance. As early as the first game in the book, we discover an 11-year-old Alexei bashing away with three of his attacking pieces on pre. As Misha Tal said, they can only take one piece at once. And of course, as a Russian born in Latvia, Alexei was not only gratefully, greatly influenced by that magician, that being Tal, but even got to analyze with him in his mid-teens. Indeed, in his combinational ferocity, one could see Shirov as one of Ta's direct lineal descendants, except that he has a quirkiness, a liking for king walks in the middle game, for example, which owes much more to a player like David Bronstein or Bent Larsen. Um, And honestly, the whole forward is good, but I stopped the quote there. And then I think you pulled a quote as well too, right, Mitch? Yeah, yeah, I I found the forward uh, very well written uh, and... Something, one thing that stood out for me uh, was this quote. Uh, in the early decades of this century, which this is uh, 1997, so the 1900s, uh, 
the old masters frequently bemoaned the impending draw death of chess. So um, this is something that is currently going on a lot. People are talking about chess being all draws, etc. So uh, it's interesting to see the the early on in the 1900s, this was also being talked about. Um, as more and more games, impeccably played, but stiflingly orthodox, ended with Black completely neutralizing the small advantage of the first move. Many generations of chess players later, chess strategy has developed to an unimaginable degree, and his dire prediction is still far from taking effect. Despite an exponential explosion in the sheer quantity of theoretical knowledge and a generally very high level of technique, the best players continue to produce totally original games, none more so than Alexei Shirov. Meticulous opening preparation and intense concentration at the board are common currency among the very top grandmasters. Alexei, however, possesses a quite extraordinary imagination, which regularly alchemizes positions the like of which the rest of, the, of us only get to enjoy under the bluest of moons. Yeah, very poetic. And yeah, again, it is really the imagination that strikes me. Um, I once almost got to interview Shirov and then uh, it, it didn't happen. And I, I'm really curious. I mean, he, he's clearly a chess bibliophile. He's mm -hmm. talked in interviews about the books that influenced him. I remember Endgame Strategy was one and he mentioned uh, a couple sort of old school Latvian books. Um, as well, but I, I have the feeling he probably did a lot of endgame studies because he's very good at the sort of bolts from the blue, like as you alluded to, uh, the moves that you or I, Mitch, where we might make a sort of autopilot type move. He's very creative. Mm -hmm. And that, like, I'll never be able to calculate like him, but it does sort of inspire me to try to look a little bit wider in positions because that's really one of the things that, that, uh, that struck me most. Yeah, I, I think one of the, the things that really struck me about his uh, really ingenious moves was how unforcing they were, how a lot of his sacrifices and like deep ideas had a lot of quiet moves in the middle of the of the combination, uh, like a, a small bishop move uh, to reposition or there was a, a few times where he would move upon uh, to defend a piece that, um, you know, earlier he had um, put on pre and uh, it, it just seems very um, hard to imagine um, as a, as a weaker player myself uh, that I'd be able to fully calculate a variation that doesn't force the opponent to make a move uh, or, or a few moves where uh, we're, we're so often taught at the lower level, like uh, captures uh, checks and threats uh, are what you first look for. And uh, he, of course, there there are forcing variations that he goes for, but there are quite a few that are much less forcing in nature. Yeah. And speaking of Shirov's moves, I mean, one thing we should definitely mention is his his most famous move of all time, the beautiful Bishop H3 against Topalov. Um, uh, some listeners may be familiar. Uh, those who aren't, I'll link to the game in the show description. You can also find a million YouTube recaps. Um, and when I did a uh, How to Chess interview with uh, a gentleman who did the most beautiful chess moves of all time. I, if I rem remember correctly, this was what I expected to be number one, and this was what he named as as uh, his his favorite. But we should mention it's not in this book. It came after, so it's in Fire on Board Two. Uh, he writes about Bishop H three. So you know, put that in another another check in the column of Fire on Board Two. Although, as an aside, I will say um, Fire on Board One. In my opinion, the games are better. Fire on board too. There's a bit more prose, but it's kind of a less interesting period of his life. I mean, he's already an adult. It's not like his his rise through the ranks. Um, so if you were, I, I, as Mitch is going to, I recommend reading them both, but I wouldn't really recommend going straight to fire on board too, unless you just want to read what he wrote about the Bishop H3 move, which is only like a page or two, but um, just absolute classic move. Um, so what we're going to do for the rest of the podcast is we're not going to go game by game. You know, this is audio only. There's only so much that can be said, and there's a lot of great games in here. Um, but we're just going to share a few sort of things that struck us about the book, a few highlights that that we enjoyed, um, and then, yeah, wrap things up. I mean, we have a lot of things that struck us, so we, we, we're not quite done yet, but we are going to take a break, and then we, we'll hop right into our favorite things from Fire On Board. 
I've been digging deeper, looking at my analytics on aimchess.com, specifically trying to improve my time management at Blitz Chess, as you guys have heard me discuss before. They have this tab called Long Thinking, where you can look to see what the outcome of moves where you spend a lot of time is. And for me, it turns out those moves tend to be better than average compared to my rating peers. So my issue is I just need to play a little bit faster every single move. It's not so much about avoiding the long things. And there's tons of insights you can get like that from aimchess.com. You can check it out for free. Explore all phases of your game with actionable drills that you can then review and download games where issues arise. Uh, So check it out for free. And if you subscribe, use the promo code perpetual30 on aimchess.com. We are back. Yeah. And there's tons that I like from this book. I think we both have a few minor quibbles that we'll eventually get to as well. But for me, you've got to start with the title. I I love the title. I can't believe it wasn't taken. I can't believe no (laughs) one had thought of it before. Um, uh, Mitch, anything to say about the title? Yeah, I mean, it's a very catching title. Um, It very well fits the book as well. Uh, There was a lot of fire on the board, and um, I I think it was very well chosen. Yeah, and so he does, as like an aside in the book, he says that the title was partially inspired by a Tal book, one of Mikhail's Tal books, which he called Into the Line of Fire, um, which... Um, in Russian, it's called Vogon attack, which basically means in fire attack. So it's kind of hard to, uh, I'm probably any native Russian speakers are probably like shaking their head in disdain at my attempts to, to translate. But anyway, to me, it didn't directly translate as into the line of fire. And I've also seen online people translate it as the fire attack, but in any event there, and this book, by the way, to further confuse things, is more commonly translated in English as Attack with Mikhail Tal, a famous book by Domsky and Tal. Um, so there's no mention of fire in the English translation. But anyway, he does partially uh, credit Tal with the inspiration. And yeah, it's just so perfect. And it's funny because when I was researching uh, for this podcast, I always like to look for other reviews just to get other people's thoughts. So I searched for fire on board in YouTube, and it turns out that Every game recap anyone has ever done of a Shirov game, they call it Fire on Board. So <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't get me very far because I'm like, well, I could watch these 300 videos of various <laughs> different Shirov games that every YouTube creator named Fire on Board, but that doesn't uh, help that much. So anyway, I think ev- the subtext is everyone agrees it's just an awesome title and very evocative. And uh, I think it sold him a lot of books. I think if he had just named it like, uh, Shirov's best games or something like just no way as many people are lining up to get it, even though the content w- would still be great. Um, what else, what struck you about the book, Mitch? Maybe we'll take turns. Yeah. So, um, I, I thought the, the openings were extremely interesting and honestly pretty varied, um, for the, um, how, it, how much he knew about the opening and how much he gives in the notes about like the, uh, theoretical novelties uh, he and his team created, uh, you would expect kind of, I, I would personally expect more of the same openings over and over. And as black, it, it kind of is that way. Uh, but as white, he played a lot of different variations. Um, I really enjoyed the F3 Nimzo games. So he has like a chunk of them in the middle, uh, or early on in chapter three. Um, there's a lot of semi-slav games, which in chapter three is only, um, it, uh, non botvinic games, so you have to wait till the botvinic chapter for those. Um, uh, he played the modern empirics uh, quite a few times, and a lot of Sicilians is black. Uh, so, uh, and then and then Kings Indian as well. Um, so there's a lot of very very variations there. And then as white, he additionally switched to e4 at some point. Um, so he had a lot of games against the French and the Sicilian, uh, and then just a, a lot of f3 variations within. Uh, D4 games. Uh, so it was very interesting to see those, especially since a lot of the uh, openings that he played um, were are ones that I've at least experimented with. Um, so it was really cool to to see um, really cool ideas from him uh, in those in those lines. Yeah, and uh, when I interviewed Johan Helston, as I mentioned, like we talked to, in that conversation, we talked about how. Johanna is a proponent of the idea that you can pick a certain player 
um, and sort of try to emulate their openings. And I think Shirov's a great person to do that. As Mitch alluded to, he does play E4 and D4 as white. So it might be slightly more challenging as white, but whether it's the King's Indian or the Semi-Slav or the Sicilian, like uh, as black, uh, yeah, he's he's a great person to emulate because there's definitely sort of a through line in the way that he plays. And he had a funny quote about the King's Indian because it's not his most common uh, opening, but it's in there a decent amount. And I know a lot of club players like the Kings Indian because it's, you know, one of the only, it's, I think one of the, even though at the top level, it's a bit frowned upon, it's, it's got one of the clearest plans and it gives you an opportunity to attack against D4. But he wrote, I do not consider the Kings Indian defense to be completely correct, but I still like this opening and, and employ it when I'm not overly concerned about points. Um, so a little shade there on the Kings Indian, but he still, he still does play it. Um, another thing that struck me on the topic of openings was his just how many un, how many novelties he unleashed. Um, and that's another thing that like, it's kind of a bygone era. Um, I mean, there still are people known for their creativity in, in openings, the Rapports and Dubovs of the world in, in modern chess. But um, he was just unleashing new moves on move 22 and again there was always some story with it about some like back room <laughs> other gm pulls him aside and shows him some move and then he waits and unleashes it um and it's it's really striking and i think it also it's another sort of major theme of the book is it illustrates his endless curiosity about chess um he's just constantly sort of enveloped you know, talking chess all the time, looking for new moves all the time. And it really shows through with like, there are just so many surprises that he unleashes on on his opponent. And it was definitely a, a major hallmark of, uh, of the success that he had. Yeah, and uh, he also several times mentions Catronius as one of his seconds who gave him a lot of those theoretical novelties. Uh, Catronius, in my opinion, most famous for his five book series on the King's Indian uh, uh, Catronius on the King's Indian, where uh, he just goes through every possible move essentially in the King's Indian. Uh, so very legendary openings author, and he also mentions Bolagon, uh, giving him several novelties as well, who uh, influenced my uh, picking up of uh, E5 against E4. Uh, I was always a Sicilian player, and then picked up Bolagon's books on E5 and switched into that, and then eventually got to uh, Gustafsson's course, uh, which is now my repertoire uh, but it's very interesting to hear um the names of uh opening authors that i'm very well uh familiar with that were uh, essentially his seconds yeah just um lots to learn um from from his handling of the opening even though again it's totally different now but again that mm -hmm. curiosity and it comes across not only in his openings where he, he's constantly looking for more, but in his exposition of variations, um, just there, there are many moments and, you know, you might consider this a warning listeners. There's, there will be like page digressions in the middle of the book filled with variations. Um, and I did pull a couple FM friends of mine. I was just curious, like, Hey, did you guys read this book? I asked uh, FM Downey Ariel and FM Nate Solon, both of whom who actually who have helped recap books and they both mentioned yeah there were a lot of variations in this book <laughs> and again i don't want to cast that as a bad thing like i think someone ambitious and who's not on deadline to record a podcast like, <laughs> could uh could really dig deep into these variations and really explore his thought process and you know um drawing on another conversation like part of what makes these players so good is that they're so concrete that they they want that search for truth and that they're exploring every possibility so the fact that i'm like skipping over the variations is part of the reason i'll you know nowhere near the player that people like that are um but i i'm not alone in someone that when i read a chess book i'm unfortunately for, for better or for worse i've made peace with the fact that i prefer some pros light annotations for the most part. Um, and you won't find that in this book. Now you should still read it and you can, you know, skim through the variations, which is what I did, but did want to give fair warning there. Yeah. And I think that's a, a good point that brings me into the best way, in my opinion, to read this book is with a physical board. Um, so to, to really move out every move in all of the variations in every uh, game. And so I will be honest, I ended up giving up on that partway through uh, because the deadline was coming up for this. And so there was a few nights where I'd 
uh, be rocking the baby back to sleep after she woke up at midnight or so. And I had my Kindle in my hand and I had to go through just on the diagrams and uh, blindfolded. And it's a very hard book to do that. It's very hard with how many variations there are to keep it in your head blindfolded. So definitely suggest a physical board. And this was honestly a, a problem for me when I just uh, recently returned to o OTB chess. Uh, my first tournament that I played, I had very terrible board vision, which is something I've never struggled with. But with all of the online chess that I've played, uh, just the physical pieces, which I hadn't used in two years, basically, um, were very hard for me to, to see. Uh, and several times I had a winning position and then I just completely forgot my king's position and gave counterplay. Uh, so I definitely suggest using a physical board when you are training so that you don't get rusty like that. I mean, if you never plan to play OTB, uh, you can use your uh, digital digital board. But if you really want to focus on OTB, I really strongly suggest, even if you are good at blindfold chess, to set up a board and use it. Um, and I, I think that you will learn a lot more that way. Yeah, I think, that, and Mitch, I know people from, from your generation and younger, like, that's a very common theme, a very common issue, like so much digital chess that it can mm -hmm. be like a transition. Someone, a dinosaur like me, it's not quite <laughs> quite as much of an issue, but but um, but I think it, it definitely makes sense, especially as you say, if you're getting ready for a tournament. And hearing you discuss that reminded me that there was one other version of the book that I wanted to mention. Of course, as Mitch mentioned, we both read it on Kindle. I already had the paper book from back in the day. But as every man chess does, who is the publisher, they also sell what they call the ebook, but which is actually like the PGN file of the entire book, meaning the chess base file of the entire book. So if you have chess base, that's another way that you can buy it. It's twenty two dollars, I think, when I looked, as opposed to like ten for uh, for the Kindle version. Um, but when you have the file, that means you're getting the games and the annotations already on your computer. Um, so that instead of sort of tag toggling between Kindle and Elite Chess Study or Kindle and ChessGames.com, um, you actually can just sit there on your laptop and read the whole book on the computer, which again, for something heavy in variations, if you're not using a chess set, um, I think can be helpful. We also should mention that they did a combined version of Fire on Board 1 and Fire on Board 2 that came out in 2017 in Kindle. I don't think there was a paper version of that. So I'm not sure if... Uh, if that uh, got corrected at all, because that brings me to the many the many engine errors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, Mitch, how do you contextualize the fact that there are even from a legendary tactician, there are so many tactical mistakes in this book? Yeah. So I, I think that that shows how important human chess is. Uh, yeah. That someone like Shirov made mistakes in his annotations and his analysis, and you know peak world number three um, or world number two, according to Wikipedia, because of uh, Kasparov not being on the list. Uh, but peak world number three made mistakes. And that is something that is so important to understand as a human that when you are reading a book and uh, you know you don't understand something you put in the computer, you're like, oh, the author's wrong. No, the, the, the author had deep thought about this variation and came to the wrong conclusion, which you will do over the board. Uh, when you were playing. Uh, so I, I think it's extremely important to see his actual thoughts. Uh, and I really enjoyed seeing his actual thoughts, especially when it wasn't what the engine said. Because, I mean, anyone can put the game in the engine and say, oh, yeah, of course, right here, F5 is the best move. Uh, but Shirov played G4 instead. But um, but it, it shows the, both the creativity and the human aspect of chess that um, sometimes the the best move isn't the move that's played by one of the best players. And uh, I think that's really something that we, we forget sometimes, especially uh, lower rated people on Twitch streams are right. always <laughs> like, oh, Magnus just blundered. Yeah. The evaluation went from 0.8 to 0.5. No, that's what not is how it doing? works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's many examples in, in the book of that. Uh, one of his games against Kramnik, uh, Total Slugfest, there's, the, there's lots of games against the... Kramnik and against the many other giants uh, of that era. But he has this famous move, Rook E4, where uh, basically a pawn can take, and when he retakes, he's opening uh, a file. 
So he's giving up a rook for a pawn in order to open a file for his other rook. And Sam Sevian, uh, obviously uh, top young American talent and grandmaster, referred to Rookie Four as one of as the most amazing movies ever seen. But meanwhile, the engine laughs. Uh, Black's evaluation gets worse when he plays it. Mm-hmm. And there's and of course, Shirov, I think, gives himself at least one exclam for the move. And it's well deserved because again, what you're looking for is. Um, you're looking for a way to sort of uh, expand your horizons, to broaden your vision. And in seeing Shirov's moves, you do that, whether they're objectively good or not. First of all, hey, he won the game against freaking Kramnik. <laughs> so it's probably going to be good enough for you, you know, d- despite what the engine says. But, you know, more generally, it's, again, just a way to sort of really help you consider all moves and consider fresh ideas and the objective merit of what the engine says is not important but we did want to mention that there's as with any again as with any book from this era uh, there's going to be mistakes but I think especially from a tactical player like Shirov like it doesn't matter how amazing he was it doesn't matter that he's one of the most gifted tacticians of all time the engine's going to find mistakes if that's your playing style and that's why of course his his predecessor tall uh sometimes um you know people say like if you look at like a cap score or whatever leech has sent upon loss tall isn't going to score as well as a petrosian but that's because uh you know that's because of the way that he played and it's inevitable but guess what if you're in like a wide open tactical position your opponent's got to navigate that as well so mm-hmm. um anyway worth mentioning but what else did you notice about this book mitch yeah so i wanted to make a, a few general notes on the style that i noticed uh especially early on in the book there was a lot of castling long uh it came up later in the book as well but it was very prevalent in the first few years of his life or first few years of his chess life uh he castled long both colors, every variation, basically. Uh, so there is uh, a Roy Lopez's black that he castled long. Uh, several games where he played d4 and c4, and he still castled long. Um, so he very much liked opposite side ca- king king castling, uh, which is a very aggressive style. Uh, there were a ton of rook lifts, um, uh, especially again earlier on in the book. Uh, very instructive uh, rook lifts where uh, he just gets a extremely nice attack on the king because he moves his rook up to e3 and over to h3 and uh whatnot uh and he really liked material imbalances um especially rook for bishop uh so the exchange sacrifice uh it almost felt a few times like he prefers bishops over rooks i mean he never said that but there was even a game where uh he did a double exchange sack so two bishops against two rooks and then he also had uh queens on the board still and he ended up winning that game, and it was beautiful uh, how well executed his attack with the two bishops was. Um, so I, I felt that that was very cool to see. Uh, and he often, of course, outplayed the rook with the bishop. Yeah, there's, yeah, it, the games are just so much fun. There are a few where your head will just be like swimming, you know, because again, the variations can be intense. He's just so strong. I mean, mm-hmm. he's just so good at chess that it's hard for him to, uh, you know, it's, we, we pick up what kernels we can, but, uh, the, but the, the guy just calculated so well. And that's something that's just hard to, hard to replicate. Um, something else I enjoyed from this book is, uh, his, his introspection. And I'm, I mean that in kind of less of a personal way than a chess way, because he doesn't, there's a bit of biography I've mentioned before when, uh, when um, Sam Copeland from chess.com and I recapped um, the life and games of Mikhail Tall. I mentioned, I wish that there was more biography in that there, there is some biography in this. It's often, it comes as kind of an aside. He'll be mm-hmm. like showing games from a tournament and mentioned that he met his wife at this tournament and, um, he talks about uh, how he had to go to university to avoid the military, but he didn't really actually do any work at the military. But his biographical notes are largely asides, uh, even when he's like winning the World Cadet, which is the World Under-16 Championship, one of his sort of breakout performances. It's primarily focused on the chess, but the games themselves are very introspective. There's a, a real search for truth, again, which is why there's so many variations, but he's also just sort of very... Um, even handed about his own performances. He says in in one of his games against Fiddler, having reached a winning position, I started to play ridiculous moves. 
And then in uh, in one of his games against Leco, which is like a long back and forth affair, he said, I'm still so disgusted with my play during the preceding stage of the game that I hope the, the reader will forgive me for not analyzing this ending too carefully. However, I will make some brief remarks. Um, so yeah, just sort of filled with emotion. Um, and, you know, one thing we should mention that I, I meant to mention earlier when Mitch was talking about how his earlier games have less annotations is this, these annotations are adopted from um, often being published other places, often in New and Chess magazine. So when I did read some online comments about the book, some people complained about that. To me, that doesn't matter at all. Like mm-hmm. as long as the annotations are good, I don't care where they came from. And as Mitch said, the fact that sometimes he adds additional comments um, uh add to it. But Mitch, what's your perspective when you read a book like this? Are you looking for lots of biographical detail or are you more in it for the chess? So I'm mostly in it for the chess, but I did appreciate the biographical information because um, like I said, I really didn't know much about Shiroff before this book. Uh, I do like, uh, like you said, a lot of the asides in the games. Uh, I think that's an interesting place to like hide in quotes uh, the biography. Um, But I mean, even just like the exposition at the beginning of the third chapter where he goes on for uh, about several years of his life, uh, just the the tournaments he played, the tournaments he won, uh, which ones were hard for him, et cetera, uh, where was at least very interesting. Uh, I wish there was a little bit more of it because um, I, I still am not extremely clear on, on some of the tournaments and whatnot. Like uh, uh, he used some terminology that I hadn't, um, heard before i forget exactly what it was it was like class 15 tournaments i i didn't know if that meant there's 15 players or uh how that worked but um so i wish there's a little bit more uh, and i wish i understood that era a bit better um but i i i still thought it was uh enough to um make me feel like i kind of knew shirov a bit uh especially this paired with some interviews i've watched on youtube which are very interesting uh it's very clear that uh, especially nowadays, all he cares about is chess yeah. um, and that he is immersed in the game. Um, there's a, a great interview, uh, which is very humorous uh, from the um, Grand Swiss, where uh, he's asked, like, oh, how are you enjoying the event? And he's like, oh, it, it's awful. I just found out that this is a qualifying event for uh, the Grand Prix. Uh, I think it's the Grand Prix. Um, and he, he, so he thought he had to get first or second to get into the candidates, but also I think the top eight or whatever were invited to uh, the Grand Prix. Um, and of course, I'm pretty sure everyone else in the tournament knew that. Right. Um, but he was far too immersed in the chess to even think about that and read the tournament information. Um, so I, I think that comes through in a lot of his games where, like you said, he's, he's in the search for truth in chess and he, um, like he met his wife at a chess tournament. He, uh, everything in his life is chess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's well said. And it definitely comes across. And again, to, to reach that level, the, it, it might be, it might be necessary, uh, for better or for worse to, mm-hmm. to just have that sort of obsession. I did want to share one biographical nugget from when he's, uh, describing his early childhood, um, because it sounds like the, the chess, The chess love may have bloomed from there because he says, I cannot say that I made incredibly rapid progress at this time, but in my opinion, the most important thing was that chess had captured my imagination and my childhood in chess was no less fascinating than that of any other child. My other hobby at that time was reading all about the countries of the world. When, for example, I heard on the radio news that Karpov was playing in Mar del Plata, my sense of fantasy was evoked. I dare say that in those early years, my prime motivation to improve my chess was to have the opportunity to travel over the world, all over the world, rather than just to uh, achieve success in tournaments. And obviously, it did take him um, all, all over the world. And I think Magnus in the Magnus documentary, he shows an early fascination with geography as well. So it's a yeah, um, interesting similarity that I'm sure some other top players um, have as well. But yeah, I mean, observations like that as the book goes on they become more sparse. Although, again, in Fire on Board 2, there are more, but it's just a totally different era for him. Um, anything else, Mitch? Yeah, I, I think another uh, example of his love for chess itself was a, a quote where he said, to fight for a second or third place was not interesting for me, but I still wish to play good chess. This ambition helped me to re- be relaxed and confident in my last games. Uh, and I, I think that came from a tournament where he won his last three or four games uh, where um, 
he wasn't looking just to win them, but he wanted to play good chess. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's inspiring. I mean, one other thing we should mention for, uh, again, for lower rated players is in addition to the fact that just the variations are staggeringly complex, there's not a lot of hand holding. There's a lot that you might have to sort of unpack on your own. So, um, I might even say that like, I mean, his, as Kostya and others have said, Kostya Kavutsky, it is great. There is no substitute for reading someone's own thoughts um, as, the, ha, as um, they annotate a game. But on the other hand, I think that that's for someone closer to Shirov's level, even though Mitch and I are nowhere near Shirov's level, we can at least follow some of it. But I think if you're rated, say, 15, 1600, even if you're going to study Shirov's games, it might be better to watch a YouTube video or something where the presenter tries to explain a little bit more because uh, he doesn't, um, yeah, not a lot of handholding. Um, but again, the guy's a genius. Why, you know, um, not every book is going to be like logical chess move by move, but this definitely uh, it is a lot different than that. Um, so I don't have much more to add. I mean, I could go on for a long time, Mitch, but I mean, I feel like we've, is there anything else we need to communicate to really sort of uh, um, impart the the gist of this book, help help listeners decide whether it's worthwhile? What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I think though we covered um, the gist of the, the the third section, and we also discussed how the Bobinic variation chapter was not really a um, an opening chapter. So definitely read that, even if you're not too interested in that. Um, so yeah, I, th I feel like we covered um, a lot of the, the great parts of this and um, yeah, caveat again, as we've spoken, it's going to be very difficult uh, in some of the games, uh, but I do think that his notes are uh, good for most levels still uh, to, to see his ideas. Yeah, and we should also mention, and he says this himself, he considers one of his greatest strengths as a player uh, his endgame ability, which you might not think is the case because he's so concrete, because he's such a great calculator, but he basically considers them one and the same. So he writes in the endgame chapter that, that that's part of where he really shines. I think with fewer pieces on the board, he feels like he can just calculate to the end. Um, so it's not so much about like principles as like, you know, he's just going to solve this this puzzle. He's just going to think it through. He also had a nice quote um, in his game against Adams. And again, I mean, uh, there's no games against Anand in this book, but basically every other giant of the, the that era, there's one game and often multiple games against. But he writes, my game against GM Michael Adams is a typical example of my play in Beal. Aggressive play from the opening, putting on the pressure, a little risk and complications, and getting the upper hand. And there is this willingness, again, the sort of tall imprint where it's not so much about the objective truth. He describes being in time trouble at several points in the book. You know, he's burning through time, trying to mm -hmm. solve every position and uh, put his opponent to the test. But again, it's um, it, it makes for very entertaining chess. So uh, if you're over 1800, I say do it up. And Mitch might be right. Maybe even over 2000 USCF is better. And if not, hopefully you'll at least have a little more perspective about uh, what makes Shirov so special. Yeah, and I, I have to say that this really felt like the right book at the right time for me. Uh, I, I felt that way before with uh, Flores Rios' book um, with chess structures. Uh, I felt like the right book at the right time that really helped me advance, and I really felt like I gained a lot from this book. Uh, and uh, the ideas that he had um, really made me think deeply about my chess. And uh, I'm hoping that that translates to to further success um, and uh, another hopeful explosion on my rating. So uh, I, nice. I really enjoyed it. Well, Mitch, I, I want to get a quick rundown on the state of your chess game, um, which hopefully listeners will stick around for. But first, two final things on the book. Um, number one, as I mentioned before, next month, play winning chess by Yaz. Uh, of course, Yaz is always a crowd pleaser. So um, looking forward to rereading and discussing that book with a gentleman named Sam Robinson. And number two, um, going to make a donation in lieu of paying Mitch for his efforts, taking time away from his busy. He's been taking tests for being an actuary on top of having a baby and a dog and a wife. So much appreciated that Mitch, uh, put in all this effort. So Mitch, uh, to whom or what should I make a uh, 
modest donation. Yeah, so I'd like the donation to go to the U.S. Chess School. Uh, I think that they do a lot of great work um, uh, getting kids here in the U.S. Um, well trained for chess, and uh, it's been um, streamed on Twitch by the Chess Dojo. Um, uh, so everyone is able to benefit from these uh, free lessons that they give out to the to these uh, kids here in the U.S. So it's a uh, really great content. I strongly suggest joining in and watching some of it or um, watching some replays on YouTube. Yeah, well said. Just search U.S. Chess School on YouTube. Uh, aforementioned Johan Helston has a lot of great lectures, um, as does Kostya and uh, Greg Shahadi, the organizer, I think pops in occasionally. Shout out to Greg. So happy to support them. Um, I donated to U.S. Chess School when it was founded. I mean, not a lot, but like, Mm -hmm. you know, a little in like 2003 or something. And I don't think I've donated since. So <laughs> it's w well past time. Um, so uh, so let's do a little bonus content if you're up for it, Mitch. Yeah, sure. Um, I'd love so to. you felt like this book um, helped your game. What's the state of your game when your mind starts drifting towards what's going on with your chess game? Where does it go? Yeah. So unfortunately, I haven't been able to um, play a lot over the board. Um, I've been extremely busy with, the, as you mentioned, uh, new baby. Uh, she's about 10 months old now, and uh, she keeps me up at night a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> so not a lot of time to play over the board. I'm, I'm about 50 minutes from the St. Louis Chess Club now. I moved here about uh, almost two years ago now. Um, but really looking forward to playing more um, uh, as, as soon as I can. Uh, I also have been very busy with uh, actuarial studies. Uh, so I honestly, the last month, maybe two months haven't really played even online chess uh, but prior to that i i definitely was feeling very strong in my chess and felt what felt like i was improving a lot um it's interesting because like my online ratings aren't as high as their peaks but i feel a lot stronger than i was when i reached those peaks uh, i i feel like i'm seeing a lot more in my calculation um and uh, uh just in general feel more confident and uh, confidence has been a, a big struggle for me before. Um, and um, I still think that probably psychological um, areas are my biggest weaknesses that I'm still hoping to work on. I'm surprised because like from my perspective, it just seems like you're like crushing it. You know, <laughs> like I feel like you're you're getting better so fast. And of course, I always see the, the back and forth on Dojo about your um your famed opening knowledge. So <laughs> but so is it like when when you're playing, you have self doubt, or how does the how does the lack the confidence issue manifest, Mitch? Yeah, so I I have both sides of the confidence issue. Um, so my first tournaments back to OCB were more I would define as rapid. I mean, people would, on Lee Chess would define it as classical as a uh, like game thirty with five second delay. Um, where I was <laughs> That's not classical. <laughs> yeah, I define that as rapid. Um, yeah. Uh, so. I got into severe time pressure in pretty much every game, uh, just kind of doubting my variations and whatnot, even though uh, I felt I was winning. I just wanted to find the truth of that and, and find the win. And you can't do that with five-second delay. Yeah. Uh, I, I flagged in, in, for the first time ever in an over-the-board game um, against um, the the uh, first seed of a tournament. Uh, in, in the, in the, so it's three tournaments in a row is like Saturday, Sunday, and Monday tournament over uh, President's Day weekend. Um, so I, I think it's President's Day. Um, I always get my holidays mixed up. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I flagged in a completely winning end game, uh, crushing him the entire game, but I wanted to find the win. Uh, I had spotted the threefold repetition to draw it. Um, and I just wanted to find the win. Couldn't be confident in my, my end game there and flagged as I was making the first rook move to get to the perpetual check. Uh, and I, I made the, the move and hit the clock and it, it flagged right then. Uh, oh, okay. So that was the, the the one side of it where I, I wasn't confident enough to make quicker moves. Uh, and then the other side, uh, my first actual classical tournament back, uh, I only played one game and then I had to withdraw because uh, Diana, my daughter, was sick. Um, and... I had extreme confidence because I, I won a piece in the opening uh, completely like checked out of the game because I was just like, oh, I'm winning, I'm winning. Uh, my opponent, who's close to 2,100 or so, um, 
got down to two seconds on the clock. He went down from 10 minutes to two seconds uh, on one move. Uh, and I really thought he was just going to flag and like, instead of resigning. And then he made a move at the last two seconds. And during that time, I just completely checked out. I was like, so overconfident that I had won the game. Uh, I was like, Oh, I want to get home and get some dinner. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm hungry. I forgot my snacks. Um, I, I, I hope that I can play, uh, Julian Prolico uh, later in the tournament because I I played him online once and got a draw and so I I hope I can play him like all all, all this stuff and instead of you know calculating and then made a few m- quick moves after that uh, blundering the piece back and then eventually losing the end game and uh, it was a really unfortunate situation so I, I have both sides of the confidence issue that um, I I really like let some outside factors affect my game. Brutal. Shades of uh, something your fellow dojo member Evan Rosenberg mentioned when I interviewed him, the the uh, proclivity to think ahead and when the game's not over. I totally understand it, it happens to everyone. But Mitch, from my perspective, a lot of what you're describing, I think if you're just playing a lot, especially OTB, I feel like that stuff would go away. But of course, it's, it's that's easier said than done. I mean, you you have a daughter and I do think it's admirable, Mitch, that like you're building a, a great career for yourself as an actuary. You're taking the time to put that and family first, but you're still managing to make make strides in chess. So I know it's a, I know it's a delicate balancing act. But again, from from what I can see, I feel like uh, it's um, you're you're doing the right things. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I I've been putting uh, family first and trying to get these exams done to get the the associated raises and whatnot to help the family out. And hopefully over time, I'll get more uh, OTB time. Uh, really looking forward to, to, to playing OTB. Because like, like you said, I, I feel like the biggest thing that I can improve on is just the OTB experience. And uh, I think that as I play more, uh, the psychological issues will go away. Because online chess, you know, uh, people resign a lot in the positions I've been getting. Um, and so I, I'm not as used to finishing off, uh, like a plus 11 game where there's still complications. Uh, so, uh, yeah. get, getting that resilience, um, fighting against that resilience will be, uh, really important for me. Good stuff. Well, Mitch, we got to save some stuff for our future adult improver interview. So last last thing before we let you go, you alluded to Chess Structures by Mauricio Flores Ruiz, of course, a tremendous book that we've recommended a lot here on this pod. Uh, you benefited from the Shirov book. You're, uh, um, you've benefited tremendously from Chess Dojo, who, I've, as I mentioned before, does awesome work. Definitely recommend people join their discord and, you know, interact with the community. Anything else that's been like equally important for your chess development? Any last tips for our listeners or uh, recommendations, Mitch? Yeah. So I I definitely think that being part of the chess dojo has been hugely impactful for me. uh, And uh, it's really made me a chess player instead of just the person who plays chess um, and has been a great community. uh, And, because of the community at the Chess Dojo, I've found it possible to be friends online with much stronger players, uh, not just the senseis of the dojo with uh, Kostya, David, and Jesse, but uh, I've had a lot of uh, great experience playing Eugene Perlstein. Uh, and it, if you had told me, you know, when I was in middle school, when I was reading uh, Eugene's books, uh, Chess Openings for White and Black Explained, which formed my repertoire for most of my chess career up until recently, uh, that I'd play him one day and get to talk with him and analyze with him. I wouldn't believe it. Like he was a legend to me, you know, and yeah. now I've played him. I've, uh, I played him eight times. And I'm actually two and six. Awesome. Um, so I'll take it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I beating, I mean, they're, they're all rapid games. So it wasn't like a classical game or anything. Um, but beating him for the first time was my first ever win against a grandmaster. And um, it was just, like such a changing moment for me. Like it went, I went from someone who loved to play chess and loved to study chess to, you know, thinking I could actually improve at chess and be really uh, potentially good one day. Uh, So it was really a great experience. And uh, I've had several calls with Eugene where we talk about openings and stuff. And it's just so cool to, you know, chat with some of the greats at chess. Awesome. Yeah. Shout out Eugene, Eugene, super nice guy. Uh, and, um, obviously 
a uh, great player and opening theoretician as well. Um, cool. And Mitch, this, I'm putting you on the spot here, but I know that Dojo has like a new program. Are, are you able to give it a plug? Because I, I, I'm not totally up on the details, but I know it involves like monthly tracking. Yeah. So um, the Dojo training program just launched, I believe, at the beginning of May officially uh, and was in beta for a little bit before that. Uh, so it's like a, a syllabus of ideas for each. Uh, I, I don't remember if it's each 100 rating points or every 200 rating points. Uh, uh, bands where they suggest playing this many classical games, analyzing and annotating and um, discussing it with peers, um, as well as which books to read at that time, um, kind of like where you should be at in your puzzle ratings. Uh, so it's kind of um, both a community, which I think is the biggest aspect of it. There's a, a training discord where a lot of people can find training partners to play 90 plus 30 games. Uh, training partners to just analyze their own games with and get their ideas from, uh, uh, et cetera, there. And then combined with kind of like a structured element of what you should be studying at this point in your uh, chess career. Excellent. Yeah. So we'll link to that for any interested listeners to check out. Yeah. And on that note, Mitch, just want to say thanks again. Um, if if people want to drop you a line, is there is the dojo the best place to find you? Yeah. Um, come to the Chess Dojo Discord. I'm, I'm a mod there. Uh, so I'm fairly active there. So you can find me there or on, on, on Twitter. I think my Twitter is at Mitch Fabian. Uh, my, my Discord is mfabian55, uh, which is also my chess.com profile and my Lee Chess is Fabian 55, so no M on it. So any of those places, uh, definitely good places to reach me. Cool. And we'll link to those, of course. And Mitch, thanks again for taking the time from your extremely busy life to help us discuss this uh, iconic but complicated book, Fire on Board. Thank you so much, Ben. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters. Those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show, going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, but most of all, thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode.